Some are driven to travel in pursuit of their dreams. For others, it's a matter of simple necessity. The course of history is founded on countless unknown lives, the struggles of winners and losers, from which but a few names survive. centuries, people's desires remain the same, and their adventures along the paths of the ancient Silk Road means history is always being written afresh. This city can be considered one of the furthest terminals of the Silk Road. The people here have a close affinity with the Orient. 118 islands, 177 waterways, 401 bridges. It's a wonder sprung from the Adriatic. All this magnificence came about thanks to the Silk Road. It was the Venetians' ability to control the trade of goods from Asia into medieval Europe that allowed them to build their Mediterranean empire. Filippo Gabbiani was born to a glassmaking family in Venice. From childhood, he dreamt of the world beyond the city's horizons. Glass from Rome first arrived in China during the Han Dynasty 2,000 years ago. Alberto has been a glass worker for 50 years. A Murano non ci sono segreti. È una una storia che si che va che va che va che va sempre avanti. E dopo come come ti ho detto prima, se uno ha volontà e un po' di testa va avanti. Se no, retro sempre E dopo un bambino e una bambina. Il bambino viene già qua a giocare con la canna e speriamo che venga anche lui qua, insomma. Speriamo segua le orme che ho fatto io con mio papà, insomma. The Gabbianis are very proud of their handmade glass, some of the finest in the world. However, Filippo intends to be a mold breaker. He has his own distinct vision for the future. Um, and in Venice there was a market, we call a, a Chinese market. And so I asked my father, I still remember the day in which I went to the Chinese market and asked my father to bring me, to buy me the first chopstick of my life. I still have it. And, uh, and uh, I started to use chopstick when I was six years old. And I insist to eat chopstick for a long time. When he was nine years old, Filippo's parents acquired a building to serve as a showroom for the family business. It was across a narrow canal from the former home of one of the city's most famous sons, Marco Polo. And I remember that as when I was a kid, I was 10 years old, I wrote my first book, was The, the Million of Marco Polo. And I started, of course, being a kid, it was like to read a fairy tale. And so when I was really a kid, I started to have this dream about China, this curiosity about it. Marco Polo is reputed to have traveled the Silk Road from Venice in the 13th century, arriving eventually in Yuan Dynasty China. His whole odyssey took 24 years, with a prolonged period of residence in China. The story of his travels was to inspire many future generations of travelers and explorers, not least among them Christopher Columbus. 
Today, it's part of the inspiration for Filippo's dream. Every inch of the map means long miles across mountains, rivers, and deserts. One third of Kyrgyzstan is 3,000 meters above sea level. The source of the Talas River lies high in the Tian Shan Mountains, but in this part of Central Asia, it's along the river valleys that most choose to travel. In a small town by the banks of the Talas, an 11-year-old girl is to start her dream journey. Nazip is to spend her long-awaited summer vacation far away from home. She and her cousin are going to travel over 100 kilometers away from their hometown. <laughs> Nazip is excited because for the first time she is going to earn her own money. A young person starting to make her way in a country barely older than she is. These are the stories of today's Silk Road. In northern Turkey, about 50 kilometers from the Black Sea, is a small town named Safran Borlu. Its name comes from saffron, the spice made from dried stamens of the crocus flower, which is literally worth its weight in gold. Saffron has been used as a food, a medicine, and a dyeing agent in both Europe and Asia for around 3,000 years. Today, its preciousness and its medicinal qualities make it popular with Chinese buyers. In the 13th century, Safran Borlu became an important trading post on the Silk Road. Wealthy merchants began to build fine houses in the city. Today, these have become major tourist attractions that sustain the livelihoods of many in the local population. This relay station, built more than three centuries ago, is known as the China Inn. kilometers away from Dunhuang in China's Gansu province, a discovery in the desert reveals more secrets of the Silk Road. This is an old beacon tower used to help caravans navigate the Gobi Desert. In 1987, the archaeologists searching along the routes around it discovered another site. Among the discoveries were inscribed wooden slips. Gansu Institute of Archaeology investigated. Over three years, more than 20,000 wooden slips and other objects were found and taken back to the Institute. Although it's difficult to decipher the fragmented inscriptions, the archaeologists were sure that they dated from the paperless era, the one before its invention. Persistence brings results. It turns out that the site was known as Shu An Chuan Jia and was a major courier station on the Han Dynasty Silk Road. The old desert outposts along the Silk Road are now, often as not, buried in sand. 
But the dry desert sands have preserved for us so many of the documents and artifacts that bear witness to the courage and tenacity of early explorers. From Safran Borlu to Shu An Chuan Jia and beyond, the thread of silk connects them all. Unraveling the stories of the Silk Road shows it was not only about traveling and pursuing a dream, but also about patience and endurance. The courier stations provided fresh horses for the fast-moving messengers. War and rebellions frequently closed one part of the route or another, but still it persisted. The value of the connections between East and West was worth all the risks. China's imperial messengers could cover an astonishing 400 kilometers in a day. This Pony Express could scarcely be surpassed until well into the 20th century. The heirs to those couriers are today's postal service. The evenings are the busiest time for postal workers. Express delivery parcels arrive in their traditional red and white stripes. of many of today's postmen might be recognizable to the inhabitants of the old courier stations. Yuan Fa Li lives in a village in the mountains near Lanzhou in Gansu. He delivers mail or parcels on foot to those living in the mountains. It's a tough job, but it makes him very proud. <laughs> Yuan Fa Li is 48, and the fast pace of change in China and his postal service has left him with some anxieties. He has been a postman for 28 years, but his contract is renewed annually. He cannot be sure for how much longer he will have his job. The next renewal date is less than a month away. With the arrival of modern communications and technologies, the traditional postman is in decline. In the past, things were different. People look forward to receiving letters, remittances, or telegraphs from their loved ones. And he was the one who brought them these glad tidings. Now, all he seems to bring is official documents. <laughs> A statue of Zheng Qian, one of the early pioneers of the Silk Road, stands in the center of the Yangguan Museum. Uh Wu Feng Ping first came to work here ten years ago when the museum was founded. Now she is its deputy curator. Behind the railings is the once famous Yangguan Road, now buried entirely by the desert. Over 2,000 years ago, these beacon towers were key military installations. Today, their remains have been mostly lost to the desert. Two 
桌面上摆放的分别是不同版本、不同时期的通关文件，简称官邸，也叫官照。圆形胡杨木呢，一份三十元；方形沙枣木一份是二十元。编写好之后，然后交给我们杜威大人，他将会用汉代呢最为流行的隶书字体，就把各位的姓名呢填写在这个通关文件上。Activities at the museum are designed to help today's tourists have some feeling how it was to be a traveler in ancient times, but it can't replicate the fear and excitement of those first steps beyond Yang Guan Pass into the unknown. According to the Han Dynasty slips, Chuan Chuan Jia was active as a courier station for over 200 years. It took the archaeologists 10 years to collate and decipher these slips. With the information from them, together with on-site surveying, the researchers were able to work out the layout of the station. The site covered over 20,000 square meters. It included kitchens, stables, warehouses, and an office area and residences. There was even a luxury suite with ensuite facilities. The station had a staff of 37 and 40 horses ready for service. It received foreign delegations from all points north and south. The largest party to arrive comprised nearly 1,700 people. Aside from the reception of visitors, its crucial function was the relaying of messages. If the courier station functioned as a rest stop, the roads that led to it were the expressways of ancient times. The slips show that 2,000 years ago, there were nine such courier stations around Dun Huang. The desert has since claimed them all. Italians still live among the glories of ancient Rome. It was their building of a road network which allowed the Romans first to subdue their rivals in the Italian peninsula and then dominate most of Western Europe. The Romans also used courier relay stations, 30 kilometers apart, a distance dictated by the endurance of a cantering horse. Among the most famed of Rome's antiquities is the Appian Way, the world's oldest paved road. It was built in 312 BC to facilitate the city-state's conquests in the south. It was also the way the first Christians would have entered the Eternal City. Though only a few kilometers from the provincial capital, Yuan Fali's village is one of the poorest in the Lanzhou region. In recent years, the villagers have started to grow lilies in their fields. Yuan's wife has a two-acre plot. It brings in a vital additional income of five or six thousand dollars annually. Hey. Yuan Fali's son, Yuan Rugang also became a postman in the city's postal department, as his father wanted. Yuan Rugan is a star at work. He has been hailed as a model worker by his superiors. But he knows that he probably won't be able to spend the rest of his life in the job like his father. Lanzhou is located at the crossroads between East and West China. It's a frontier city of dreams and opportunities. Like many before him, Yuan Rugang hopes that moving to the city will set him on the road to a better life. <laughs> Yuan Senior has a motorcycle from the post office. 
Although he still has to do 20 kilometers on foot, he's grateful he can use the motorcycle to get most places. The farthest place he has to travel is almost 100 kilometers away. Since Yuan and his son work full-time as postman, Mr. Yuan's wife is responsible for both house and farm. If Yuan gets a permanent contract with China Post, it means he will be able to get his official retirement benefits when the time comes. West of the Yangguan Pass is the Gobi Desert, the biggest desert in Asia in a harsh and unforgiving environment. This is the remains of an old road with the ruts made by vehicles that passed along it millennia ago. The travelers on these roads brought new goods, new species of plants and animals, new technologies and new religions from one side of the world to the other. The lake at Lop Noor once covered 20,000 square kilometers. Shrinking year by year, century by century, it has steadily been reduced to an intense salt lake. Salt mining ships now ply the lake in an industrial project worth $90 million. Much of the surface of the former lake at Loch Nor is now entirely dry, but a few feet underground, it's another story. A workforce of 1,000 arrived at the heart of Loch Nor to build the world's largest sylvite mining center. In 2002, it was designated as the town of Lot Noor, one of the largest and least densely populated in the country. The Silk Road has never been short of miracles of reinvention. On China's east coast, miracles are occurring with even greater frequency. Within a decade, Shanghai has become the city with the greatest density of high-rise buildings in the world. Filippo Gabbiani is on the move from Venice to Shanghai. He wants to try his hand at miracle-making as well. So it was incredible. So the entire Shanghai rise up for 32 in 10 years. So they, they built 8,000 towers from the day in which I come the first time and the day I, I come back after 10 years. And it was amazing. I cannot recognize anything anymore. 20 years ago, when Filippo was a student studying architecture, he took a three-month trip to China. He traced his way along the old courier stations of the Silk Road. And like a a little student and I went all around China by bus and train only and uh, and I've seen this country that was amazing uh, China is a, such a vast country with such a variety of culture and so for the first timer uh, for a first time uh, visitor uh, it was really really a cultural shock and uh, an incredible um, leaf of inspiration For the next 10 years, he traveled the world. But when he came to Shanghai for the second time, he decided to stay. 
and all the silence that we need to be more silent. We, but and the problem is to play on the tone facade, as we know, and to maintain the internal culture. What we have to do in this area, mm-hmm. and in this area, direct light from outside, but can be from the skyscraper. Mm-hmm. This is a project important, and now we are trying to define the final one with them. That is going to be very, very in 2002, Filippo and his business partner moved their business to Shanghai. Okay. A collaborative office where we have seven associates, where most of them are Chinese, and they're incredible designers. And our target, our dream was to want to make an office that was Shanghai-based and go back to try to reconquer the rest of the world. This Kyrgyz girl, Nazit, reaches her destination, a meadow on the western slopes of the Tian Shan Mountains. The yurts mark the site of a holiday resort. Nazit will work here for the summer. The camp is on the main road, attracting tourists from the capital, Bishkek, who drive out for lunch. The beautiful scenery always entices some to stay longer. For those on the Silk Road, this was a shortcut through the Tian Shan Mountains to Central Asia. The yurts are a rest stop for travelers, just as in ancient times. This is Kyrgyzstan's high grassland. Nazip has never seen so much greenery before. Although it's barely 100 kilometers from her home, life here is completely different. <laughs> Nazip grew up in a farming village, but there are lots of new challenges here on the ranch. It's the season for the mares to have their foals. One of Nazip's jobs will be to milk the mares. Nazip hopes to get the hang of it soon. The border in Xinjiang, Ni Ni is celebrating her 24th birthday. This Kazakh girl once dreamed of being a TV host or an actress. But after she graduated from college, she went back to her hometown of Ile as her parents asked her to. Today, Ni Ni is trying on her wedding dress, a traditional Kazakh wedding dress, handmade by her mother. Her grandmother has saved her a set of jewelry.
The Silk Road is a new road, as well as an old one. Those who venture onto it are always seeking something new, something better. Filippo lives at its two extremities. Venice, his past, and Shanghai, his future. Nazip is learning the way of the grasslands. While the courier stations of Gansu patiently serve those from near and far. Sanway Mountain is part of the Chilean Range. The dry and desolate landscape is like scenery from Mars. At its foot sits the Shu An Chuan Jia Courier Station. How could the station be sustained in a desert like this for over two centuries? The answer lies two kilometers away, hidden in the mountains. Shu An Chuan literally means hanging spring. It's the only water source in the area. For those on the Silk Road, it was the difference between life and death. It's 8 o'clock in the morning, and the shuttle bus is leaving for Yangguan Museum. The museum is 70 kilometers away from the city of Dunhuang. Because of the distance involved, the staff only go home on alternate nights. It was a lonely and desolate place at which to build a tourist attraction. Ten years ago, when the museum was founded, Wu Fung Ping started as a guide straight after graduating from college. The museum was built in the style of the Han Dynasty, just like the Shu An Chuan Jia courier station 2,000 years ago. The peak tourist season lasts just three months. The rest of the time is given over to preparation and waiting, just like those who watched over the route all those centuries ago. Two months after her graduation, Nini has found a job. Nini is also set to become a tour guide in a local museum. Today, she is training for her first tour. To the uninitiated, the job may seem easy, but Nini is discovering that there is more to it than meets the eye. <laughs> Nini graduated from Xinjiang University of Finance and Economics. Apart from Kazakh and Chinese, she also speaks English and Russian. She never imagined becoming a museum guide, but it's her first step on the road to independence. July is the most beautiful season on the grassland. A photography studio invites Nini to model for a window display. Ile is a Kazakh autonomous prefecture, which is why the studio wants a Kazakh girl to feature in their photos. Hey, go to the far. This year, you go to the far. Hey, Nini, send her up. 
，哎，表现再柔美点，再笑一点，再笑一点，不够傻，再傻一点。With the magnificent mountains in the background, who could not be inspired to believe that old dreams can become true somewhere along the length of the Great Silk Road? 100 kilometers from Xuan Chuanjia, still deep in the Gobi Desert, is the Lugor Railway Station. Its work goes on around the clock. The 45-year-old Sun Yan Zhang has been working here for 25 years. The only line that connects Xinjiang to the rest of China runs through here, and Lugor Station is where it connects with the Dunhuang Railway. It's a small station in a crucial position. The small station has a staff of ten, divided into two units that work alternating eight-hour shifts. They have to man the platform for every train that passes, although only very few actually stop. This green train stops at every small station. It also brings in fresh vegetables and staples like rice and flour. The station staff take this train home every four days. They have to do it in rotation. Recently, a big logistics base is being built nearby, and the construction workers are becoming a familiar sight. The history of railways in China is not much more than a hundred years old. Its full-fledged development began in the 1950s. That was when Sun Yanzhong's parents left their hometown in Hunan and joined hundreds of thousands of railway workers building the Lanzhou to Xinjiang Railway. The family moved westward with the progress of the line. It's a paradox that those transited temporarily down the road are often better remembered than those who built or maintained it. However, in piles of wooden slips unearthed at Xuan Chuanjia, a man named Guang was mentioned 150 times. If this refers to just one person, it means he was in his desert posting for 40 years. Guang was the clerk of the courier station, responsible for recording every goods caravan and every individual that passed through. He also did the accounts. His records show how a courier station worked. Both today's Lugor train station and the old Xuan Chuanjia courier station are similar cogs in a much bigger system. But every system, however big, relies on the efficiency of its smallest part. The station master has just chanced to discover that they have a load of steel pipes and liquefied gas all on the same freight train. If anything goes wrong, it would be like the station being hit by a massive bomb. 
，直接整列转算了，我看来不及了，这样的。不够款了，刚不出来。这咱的害怕把小曼车给影响了，只要他能拉出去，咱们就好办。For every decision they make in their control room, they have to report to a higher level of management for approval. In the meantime, they have to keep in close contact with the previous station and the next one. In the modern railway system, the chances for error are greatly reduced, but nothing can be left to chance. In 40 minutes, a slow train with nearly a thousand passengers will arrive at the station. There is no time to reschedule the freight train. Time is ticking away. It's paramount to ensure the safety of the passenger train. It's decided to move the freight train to another track. Blue Gore Station, as small as it is, plays a key role in the whole system. Not far away, a new high-speed rail link is under construction. Only the desert sunset remains as it ever was. Several hundred years ago, Marco Polo returned to Venice, the wealth of his 24 years of travels stashed in precious stones. He died decades later, still a wealthy and respected merchant. Filippo is proud of the jewel-like glassware produced by his family's craftsmen on Murano. He returns to Venice with his Chinese fiancée for a vacation. When he was a child, Filippo used to go with his parents to eat at Venice's Chinese market. His appetite for China never diminished. Maybe this story is strange. Right? My father, before to stay with my mother, he had a relationship with a Taiwanese woman. Eh? And <laughs> so this kind of interest common in our family. I know. Marco Polo took a 24-year round trip down the Silk Road to China. Today's travelers from Europe could do it in a day. The life in Venice is sweet indeed. Filippo has decided his future belongs in Shanghai. I born here and I live around the world. I miss this place so much. And uh, now I'm, I'm gonna get my family with my wife. And we strongly want our kids to born here in Venice. Also because Venice is losing its the citizens. And uh, but Shanghai at the same time give you the perception of what is today and tomorrow and what's gonna happen and the excitement of doing things. In 2004, Filippo's company won a contract to renovate a building in Shanghai. The renovation integrates Grecian marble columns, Italian tiling, and most importantly, the Venetian red glass chandeliers, which are a signature work of the Gabbiani craftsmen. And now finally this is happening, because finally working based in China and in Shanghai, Make made in China international top level and we export in the rest of the world. In 
in Kyrgyzstan, Nazip is learning the ways of the grassland. She feels flushed with the freedom and the responsibility. Still just 11 years old, the future now beckons more brightly. In Lanzhou, Yuan Fa Li is happy to renew his contract for another year. It will complete his full three decades of service. After four days on, Sun Yen Zhong catches the slow train home. It's a commute familiar to him for a quarter of a century and will long continue to be so. Throughout history, numerous envoys, merchants, priests, adventurers, conquerors, and scoundrels have traveled along the Silk Road. But whoever travels the road, it's those who patiently man the stations of the route that are the true guardians of its heritage and its future. The centuries, and especially the last few centuries, have seen enormous changes in the world. What remains unchanged is the journey every individual makes to fulfill his or her purpose in life. Like the hidden spring, humanity is eternally refreshed by its dreams for the future. And no matter how far they've come or how far they'll go, they'll always need to stop for a moment to rest and imbibe before traveling on. Afu is a Turkish student at Xi'an's Northwest University. Like those earlier adventurers on the Silk Road, Afu hopes to build his future in Xi'an. Join us for part four of Silk Road, The Journey Goes On.